So we ended last video by turning our ball drop code into a projectile code where I can send the ball up and down uh, uh, vertically like that or I can add on some x velocity. Maybe I give it a one meter per second x component for its velocity. And I can get very similar results here where I'm going up and then down, but I'm also moving to the right along the way. And what's fun to watch about this is that velocity vector uh, is going to change, excuse me, the momentum vector is what we attached it to, is going to change throughout the trajectory. Let's actually slow this down a little bit. Let's maybe make this a tenth of what it was before. Because if you slow the animation down, what you can see is what happens to the velocity. It's always pointing to the right but it's changing from upward to more downward. Let's actually change the scale on that. Uh, just make it a little bit more visible. Maybe make that twice as big. The actual size of that arrow doesn't matter. It's just the scale. So it's happening as it gets smaller. It's getting smaller because it's getting less velocity uh, in the vertical direction. And then it's getting more in the downward direction which is exactly the same as what happens when you just launch it vertically, right? The Y component of the momentum is actually behaving the exact same in both of these scenarios. It's just that when I add an X component here, I keep that X component throughout. Uh, oops, that did not actually change, there we go. And so here, the vertical piece is changing, but if you look at the width of this arrow along the x-axis, that, that rightward width is always staying the same. And so that's actually really cool because that tells me I can separate the vertical motion and the horizontal motion just like we're doing here with these vector components. Now, why doesn't the horizontal component change? Well, because there is no force in the horizontal direction, right? Gravity works down. It does not work to the left or right. And so it's only changing the Y component because I only have a Y component in my force. I have no X component in my force. Well, what kind of force could you have that changes the X component? Well, this is where we get into the drag force. So in this video, we're gonna add in air resistance. What's cool about air resistance is that it is a variable force, right? One of the things about weight, it's nice to start with weight because we're familiar with it. We have an idea of how it works. We know it needs to point downward. We know it needs to be stronger based on your um, mass. And we know that it needs to change based on the planet you're on. So we have your mass or the mass of the object. We have the planet you're on and then we have down. And those three things make the weight. That's a great thing to start with. But weight is kind of boring, right? Constant force motion is great to start with. But after you do it a couple times, you realize it's always going to make this parabola. No matter what I change the components to, it's always going to make some kind of parabola. And I can stretch and squish and move that parabola around. It's always going to make the same trajectory. And there, there are some well-meaning physics courses that will spend an entire month on projectile motion because I really want you to learn this and that's their choice to make. I prefer to spend as little time as possible on projectile motion because it's the same thing every time. It's always a projectile and the computer kind of makes it a, a trivial problem to study. On the other hand, drag makes things a little bit more interesting because drag is a variable force because air resistance, the way air resistance should work is that it should always oppose the direction of motion. Let me actually full screen this so that we get a little bit better view. There we go. Um, for air resistance to be modeled, we need it to get stronger uh, as the velocity gets faster, and we need it to always oppose the direction of the velocity. So for it to always oppose the direction of the velocity, I need a negative sign. I need it to be negative and then velocity. I also need it to get stronger as the motion gets stronger. So that's why I need the V here. V hat will not do. I need the full velocity vector here. It's magnitude and direction summarized in the velocity vector here. So this negative V takes care of these first two items that it's always going to oppose the direction of motion and it's going to get stronger as the motion or as the particle gets faster. But then I also need a piece that depends on the material, right? Because going through air should be a little bit easier than going through water, right? Because water is going to put up more resistive force 
than air is. And so how do I factor that in? Well, that means I need something called an intensive property. Intensive property just means it is a constant associated, well, not necessarily constant, I shouldn't say that. An intensive property is a value that is associated with the material or the object itself. And I know that sounds vague, but that's because we're lumping a bunch of stuff into this B value. So for example, this drag coefficient is going to depend on the density of the material. Because if the material is more dense, right, if I, if I pressurize the air or if I go from air to water, if I make it more dense, I'm going to have more interactions with more particles. And so the drag force should get stronger. It should also depend on the roughness of the surface. So if I've got a nice smooth aerodynamic surface, I should get a very low drag force. If I've got uh, a very rough, you know, like sandpapery surface, I should get a stronger drag force. It also uh, takes into account the size of the object, right? A bigger object like a parachute should pick up more drag force than a smaller object like a ping pong ball. And so all of that stuff, all of those factors get lumped into this B. You can separate those out if you want. You can make this density times area times a proper drag coefficient times whatever. But in terms of the computer model, it's easier to just lump them all together into one number. So this number just takes all of that stuff into account. It's a thing we get from the lab or from a table, or we just change in the model to see what it does. So the important thing is I need negative times a constant times the velocity vector. So let's go over to our code, to our projectile code here, and let's add in a drag force, right? I can put whatever I want in this code. Uh, the reason we use a code instead of a graphing calculator is because I can go back and easily make additions to it. I can leave the rest, right? You don't have to change any of the rest of this because the rest of this works. Like you never have to go back and recreate the weight force. Like you went on a graphing calculator, you've got to put in negative mg, negative mg, negative mg every single time. Here I just put it once and it's ready to go. So what I'm going to do is put in a new line. Uh, I did that by pressing the enter key and you notice it automatically indents for me because I need that indentation to say that this is part of the loop. And I'm going to start to calculate drag. So drag needs to equal, remember it's a negative. I need my drag coefficient. Uh, let's actually spell that out, drag coefficient, just so that we remember what it is. I called it B on the slide, but you can spell things out in a computer code, so it's just nice to remind yourself what it is. And then I need to multiply by the particle's velocity. Now, I will need to make a little change to this because I've been working with momentum. I have not been working with velocity. So my velocity is just set up here. So I'm going to need to change the velocity up here. So what I will need to do is make another enter and say particle.velocity equals the particle's momentum and divide it by the particle's mass, right? So I'm just taking uh, this equation and I'm rearranging it, right? So that I can get back the velocity because the momentum is changing each time it goes through this loop. I also need to update the velocity. So we'll just change that there. I also need to tell the computer what my drag coefficient is. So I like to put my constants up at the beginning. So let's set the drag coefficient. Uh, it's, it's nice to just start with a simple value. Let's just start with 0.1. Um, again, I, this is something you could get from a lab if you wanted real world values. Um, these drag coefficients can take lots of different values depending on the thing you're working with. Uh, what kind of units is this going to have? Well, I need to end up with units of newtons, so it's going to have newtons, but then I need to cancel the units for velocity. So this thing needs to take meters per second and turn it into newtons, so that means it's going to have units of newtons per meters per second. And this looks kind of funny. It's only funny because um, we made meters per second the units for velocity instead of using just a singular unit it's a combined unit and so the meters per second kind of shares the denominator there you could simplify this if you wanted to I don't know that it makes any more intuitive sense to do that but you certainly could if you wanted to okay so I have calculated my drag force I have put negative drag coefficient times particle velocity I am updating the velocity and I have dra defined drag coefficient now I need to add that onto my net force <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Remember, net force is the total of all the forces. So I can put weight plus drag. You notice I'm just adding them up because I've already got the direction taken care of in here. I don't need weight minus drag or drag minus weight or anything. Um, some people like to put a negative on here because they think, well, the weight's going down, so it should be a negative. Remember, we already have the direction taken care of. So when you're adding vectors, we really, we really don't talk about a vector being positive or negative because it's got any number of directional combinations. Um, so when we talk about net force, we're just talking about adding these things together. Okay, so this was the projectile that we got before. And you know, I almost never remember to do this, but I'm gonna take a screenshot of this so that I can compare these. So this is without the drag coefficient. And what I'm going to do is open up paint. And what I'm going to do is paste that in just as a little reminder of what my uh, previous result looked like. Because I always tell y'all, you know, compare the result, compare the result. I always forget to tell you to record the result. You can't compare things you don't record. So let's run it again now with our drag force. Add it in. You notice I get very similar result, right? It, it's going to go up and come down, right? Because drag force doesn't drastically change the nature of the motion. It just changes how it accomplishes that motion. So I still go up and come down. I can already see a little bit of difference here. It looks like it's not going up quite as high, which I would expect, right? I would expect that the drag force is going to rob me of some of the motion. It's going to rob me of energy, like we'll talk about later. Uh, and so I should not get quite as high. And once you notice a qualitative difference like that, that the, that the motion looks a little bit different, we want to start exploring it more quantitatively. So let's go from 0.1 drag coefficient to 0.5. Up and then down. Now, one of the things I start to notice here, again, I don't go quite as high, but I also notice my parabola is not quite as symmetric. So imagine you're, you're, you're dropping a vertical line down here and you look at the left half and the right half. My left half is much broader. My right half is a little bit sharper. It falls much more sharply than it rises, right? Especially if you compare it to the screenshot earlier, this parabola is nice and symmetric. Well, a parabola has to be symmetric. There's no such thing as an asymmetric parabola, meaning this is no longer a parabola. So the drag force is actually breaking the type of trajectory that you had before. It's no longer a parabola. Let's see what happens if we increase that even further, right? That's the goal in physics is turn stuff up until it breaks. Still that quote from the late, great Robert Jordan. Yeah, now we are definitely asymmetric, right? If I, if I, I usually you can, sh oops, nope, nope, nope. I did that wrong. I did that wrong. All right, let's get this back to normal view. Usually you can shift click to move this, that is not working today. Or is it control click? All right, let's just rerun it to reset the view. I'm trying to be too fancy here. And that rotates. All right, there we go. Shift click translates, moves it along to the right or left. Yeah, definitely asymmetric here, right? So, you know, drop the, you know, drop a vertical line down here. Uh, it definitely looks different. It's got different curvature on the left than on the right. Again, let's just keep increasing. Uh, if one is good, then five must be better. Right? You notice the initial condition is always the same, right? This launch velocity vector is always the same. The force changes the trajectory along the way. Here it's definitely different, right? There ain't no parabolas in math that look like that. Uh, it's actually a little bit of a, a Nike swoosh upside down. Um, I can say that without getting sued because uh, it's from Greek, ancient Greece, not from a corporation. Yeah, you can definitely see there's asymmetry there. And why is that? The, the thing you want to ask yourself as a physics student is why does it change from the upward to the downward? And you can think about that in terms of the gravity interacting with the drag force and when are they working together and when are they working against each other? You can kind of think through why that would make the parabola different there. So anyway, this is one of my favorite problems is adding in the drag force. Uh, usually before computers, we could not do this. Like when I was in high school, uh, we had computers, I'm not that old, but we didn't have computers doing this type of stuff in the classroom and we had to just ignore air resistance because you as a human, we can't do this math, right? We cannot do this math without some very advanced 
calculus stuff that usually you don't even get to in uh, in an undergraduate program. And now thanks to the computer, we can add in drag force and see what's happening there in the real world.